Hey guys, my name's Ravi Sharma and I am the founder and buyer's agent here at Search Property. Thank you so much for joining me on yet another episode of Search Property TV. If you haven't had the chance, smash the like button and subscribe down below because I'm bringing out two to three videos every single week. So today's video is really about understanding the difference between units and houses as an investment choice. This is a very debated topic when it comes to investing and what's a good investment and what's not. As disclosure, uh, this is obviously not financial advice. However, it's just interesting to explore both options and what are the pros and cons for each one. Now, when we're looking through uh, assessing whether units or houses are better as investments, we're gonna look at mainly five topics. So capital growth, rental returns, holding costs, control, and location. Capital growth. Houses have capital growth, units don't. Now this I don't agree with at all, and it doesn't take a genius to understand something so simple, like the fact that if units did not actually experience any capital growth, then units that were selling for $100,000, say 15 years ago, should technically still be 100K, right? And that's clearly not the case. When we are looking at assessing capital growth across different capital cities and obviously regional markets as well, we can see there's a correlation between houses having higher levels of capital growth as a percentage. But when we're really looking at this, we've got to factor in the fact that this is all very generic. This is applying to a whole suburb. It's applying to a whole capital city. And that's not really the case uh, when you're looking at suburbs street by street and what works and what doesn't. What you really need to consider is things like demographic, what the people in the area actually want and what's in demand, and what does future supply look like? So these are the two areas that we're gonna look into a little bit further when we're going through this video. So I wanna to bring to your attention a very interesting table uh, that I found. It's unit prices and house prices over the last 25 years. Now this is a a study done by CoreLogic. And as you can see, house values over the past 25 years nationally have grown at an average annual percentage of 6.8%, bringing the average median house value, uh, this is of 2018 obviously, is 571,441. Now when we cross over and we look at unit values, what's surprising here to many is that the average percentage change here is 5.9%, and is actually bringing the median value to 515,610. So what exactly does this mean? It means that although we've been continually to think that houses are outperforming units, it really comes down to specific markets where I've seen suburbs in which units have actually outgrown houses as a percentage. So it's really important that when we're looking at these numbers, that we take it with a grain of salt understanding what's happening on a more granular level is important, especially when you're looking at investments in particular areas. When it comes to housing and units, the issue of affordability becomes a very big factor when investors are looking to invest in a property or when owner occupiers are looking to purchase in a particular suburb they really like. Something that really sticks out on this table that I put up is the Sydney median value. Now, of course, this is from 2018, so we were actually above the 1 million threshold, which has now reduced in 2020. But there's a difference there of almost $300,000 between the average median value of Sydney house prices versus the unit prices being 753,000. The importance here is again, that investors and owner occupiers may have an affordability issue when it comes to purchasing houses over units. The next topic is rental returns. Houses have worse yields than units. It generally is true. Uh, so when we're looking at yields, it's usually how much of the rental are you getting as a proportion, as a percentage uh, of the house price or unit price that you actually purchased it for. Uh, units will have a higher yield, rental yield return, when we're purchasing a one bedroom unit versus a three bedroom unit. And this is where some of the data that gets skewed is not even considering the fact that there's older properties and there's newer off the plan properties that are coming into the market. But essentially as a rule of thumb, houses do have a lower rental return. However, this can be alleviated and it can change over time because with 
a house, you can always go in and extend it. Maybe you add an extra room, which increases obviously the rental return. You may even have the possibility of adding a granny flat in the back, and that's obviously gonna increase your uh, rental yield. Whereas when we're seeing units, it's pretty much what you see is what you get. Uh, you can't really add value uh, by adding a whole new bedroom in there or by adding a, a new dwelling attached to it. Obviously you can't do that. So when it comes to rental return, unfortunately houses do have a smaller rental return. However, again, if we're looking at particular markets, uh, there are areas out there that are giving you rental returns of seven, eight, nine, 10% even sometimes. Uh, whereas units, if you've chosen it in a particular area, you may only receive only a four or 5% rental yield. So again, location is so important. Holding costs, better depreciation with units as they have less land. Holding costs is very interesting because they play pros and cons for both houses and units. Now, when we look at holding costs, for houses, you've got higher maintenance costs because there's more bedrooms, there's more bathrooms, and obviously there's the upkeep of, you know, the external part of the building, but also in the backyard. Whereas you don't really have that with a unit. It's usually a very low maintenance uh, affair, and that's why it attracts a lot of younger people to actually move into a unit or at least purchase them. Now, when we're looking at maintenance costs, um, we've also got to, we've got to figure out that with holding costs, we've got strata and body corporate fees. Now with both uh, council rates is unavoidable, you've got to have insurance, but an added cost is usually the body corporate or strata fees that you get with units. That is not something you have to pay for when it comes to houses. However, we have council rates and that's reflective of the land value. So sometimes you could find yourself paying a lot more for the house in terms of council rates, but you also do have to pay council rates as part of units. Something that people don't really pick up on is the fact that when units are purchased, uh, they are actually purchased with a smaller land content. So what that means is that if say there's a 600 square meter block of land and there happens to be three dwellings on top of each other, then it would be 600 divided by three, meaning the total land for each unit would be 200 uh, square meters. Whereas for a house, it's the exact land that your house is built on. So when we're looking at a property like a unit, we've got a very small land content. So what they believe is that the amount that you're paying is more so for just the property itself. Now we know that the build is depreciating, whereas the land is appreciating. So what that means is we can actually gain a lot of tax benefits with a higher depreciation when we're purchasing a unit uh, relative to that of a house. Control, more opportunities for upgrades. I think this one's fairly evident, but with control, what I mean by that is if you own a house, you own the land and that's your parcel of land, your real estate, that you can do whatever you like subject to obviously council approvals. Now there's certain zonings where you're allowed to do certain things without even asking the council, but you have a lot more control. So when we're looking at, maybe it's adding a secondary dwelling like a granny flat, or maybe you're looking at extending your house, maybe you're looking at potentially adding a pool, again, all subject to council approval, but it gives you the opportunity to do those things and you're not having to ask anyone else apart from the council. But when we get into a unit or block of units, um, it really becomes a game where it's a voting system. So let's say for instance, you're in a block where there's 30 other owners you have a strata meeting and if they decide that they wanna upgrade the lifts or they may wanna add a new garden bed in the front of the property, uh, on the common property, then that's something that people have to vote for. So the owners will come together and they all make a vote as to whether they want to go ahead with the repair or the upgrade. And unfortunately, if the votes go against you, you're gonna to have to pay up because it's all proportionally divided for the cost. So that's where you have a lot less control because you can't exactly go outside and say, oh look, I wanna change the facade of the entire building. You need to get the approval of everyone else or a majority of everyone else until you can actually do that. Whereas you obviously don't have the same sort of restrictions when it comes to a house. Location, closer to beaches and CBD. Now this is a very interesting topic and I think this is where it really comes down to what your strategy is and what you're looking to do long-term. When you're looking as an owner occupier, you obviously wanna be taking advantage of amenities that are around. Maybe there's gentrification in that location. 
It's really about taking advantage of those things. Now, generally speaking, it's very difficult to actually be able to purchase a three bedroom house that's gonna be affordable really close to the CBD. So what we generally find is that people that are looking at investments, they're really buying houses that are maybe 20, 30 or 40 kilometers away from the heart of the CBD. Whereas when we're looking at units and people looking to spend sort of the same amount, we're really looking at that inner ring, the inner ring suburbs, and that are probably about 10 kilometers from the city itself. Now, the advantage here is that you're able to take advantage of the amenities, the local community, and perhaps the distance to the CBD is very attractive for potential renters. Whereas if you're living 30 kilometers away from the heart of the CBD, like most people are purchasing in Sydney, you're really relying on people that want to have a bit more space, that want to actually have specific schools, they may have more family out there, and they're not really interested in traveling into the city for work or you know, being socialites uh, and going down to cafes. Bonus tactic, buying unit blocks, unique properties. So this is uh, my personal favorite. So when I'm looking at houses versus units, now me personally, as part of my portfolio, I've got units, I've got townhouses, and I've got houses, right? So I prefer to, um, so for me personally, I don't really care if it's a unit, house, or townhouse. As long as the numbers make sense, it's gonna be a deal for me, right? Whereas too many people are getting caught up with the traditional way of thinking, which is land appreciates, buildings depreciate, so why would you buy a unit? Uh, unfortunately, that's not really the case when you're looking at numbers. I personally have uh, some units that have actually outperformed the houses in my portfolio. And that's where it comes down to really understanding what's driving the market. If it's demographics, we're looking at people that want to live in those areas. Maybe we're looking at population in that area where they actually live by themselves, or maybe they're corporate professionals that actually have really big demand for one, two, or three bedroom units that are looking at the beach or that lifestyle location where you've got cafes around. So when I look at my bonus tactic, buying unit blocks, this is where you can actually go into specific towns, uh, specific areas uh, across Australia where you can actually go and buy a set of three units or a set of four units, and they're basically on one title. That's where you own all four of the units. What that means is that you're able to, if council approves it, you're able to go in, purchase as a bulk deal. Now that may cost say $400,000, meaning each one is costing $100,000. What you do is you go into the market and you see, okay, other two bedroom units are selling for say $160,000. You can actually go and submit to the council that you wanna have each one individually titled. What this does is actually a huge growth hack because what they will have to do is when they divide each one into individual units, now they're classed as a two bedroom unit on its own. So what does the valuer have to compare it with? Other two bedroom units. So let's say for instance, you've got a four block unit and you then strata title them and each one has to now go and be compared to other units that are 160,000, 150,000, whereas you bought them four for 400. So suddenly your value has just gone straight up and you've manufactured that equity. If that's something that's of interest to you, uh, I can definitely make a video in, in depth about how exactly that works. But essentially, if you're looking at blocks of units, you have complete control. You own the land, you own all four units, meaning you're the strata, you're the one person that uh, needs to vote, and that's where you have a little bit more control. Now, when people look at, well, no land content with units, well, when you're building or you know buying a block of units, you own the entire land. So I've seen in markets, and I personally have one of these, where I've got three units and you individually title them, you manufacture the equity, and the cash flow is really good achieving six, seven or 8%. And this is where you're able to take advantage of the capital appreciation of having large land, but also good benefit of having good cash flow and manufacturing equity. I guess as an overall, you need to really be focusing on what's unique. So it's a simple game of demand and supply, right? It's really about understanding the local economy there. So if you're getting into an apartment, say in Rhodes or in Parramatta or Westmead, you've got a thousand other units there already, and there's actually a huge amount of supply that's coming into the market in the coming years. So what does that mean? It means that your value of the property 
is actually going to be dictated by what everyone else is selling for. And what does your unit mean in terms of uniqueness? Do you have a particular view? Do you have a penthouse? Do you have a courtyard? And that's where it becomes a real game of understanding a little bit more than just looking at high level numbers of this is the median range, this is how much the percentage growth was because there's a lot more to it. So that's a perfect segue into me letting you know that if you are looking at this video and you're going, I'm still confused, I don't know what works for me, it's pretty much because you don't have a strategy or an effective strategy. So book in a strategy session down below, there's a link there and it's basically a chat where we can actually look at your goals, create a framework and look at creating a roadmap from taking you to point A to point B. It's complimentary, so you may as well book it and I can help you look at what's actually gonna work for your profile and look for what properties you need to purchase in order to get to where you need. Thank you so much for joining me on another episode of Search Property TV. If you could please subscribe down below, that'd be amazing. I'll catch you guys in the next video.